So this one, I wanted to show you what a chronic total occlusion in the SFA looks like if you've never seen it. And I also wanted to show you two different scenarios and what the thought process would be, at least uh, what you should be thinking about. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive discussion, but at least it gets people that are just starting out to, to start thinking about this stuff. So in this case now, we have a 72-year-old gentleman uh, with critical limb ischemia, status post left above knee amputation, who presented with severe rest pain in the right foot times three months. He has the typical risk factor, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, he had a cabbage already in the past, he's a smoker for 60 years, and he is well controlled in terms of he's on the appropriate medications for his uh, uh, blood pressure, um, hyperlipidemia, his diabetes, he's, on, he's, he's obviously on insulin, and he was already on baby aspirin and on clopidogrel. So kind of the classic medications you would expect. <clears throat> he has a left AKA. On the right side, uh, he had a normal groin pulse. His popliteal artery pulse and his pedal pulses were Doppler, so we know we have a problem somewhere in the leg. He had dependent rubor and chronic ischemic changes and elevation pallor. For those that don't know what elevation pallor is, basically you have a foot that looks you know, red or has rubor, you elevate the leg for about a few minutes and it turns white. That's classic elevation pallor because there's no gravity to help blood get by the collaterals and whatever vessels are open still to the foot and so it turns white. The other thing to remember is that's also how you differentiate cellulitis of the foot compared to just pure ischemia. Because cellulitis, it, it really shouldn't turn white. <clears throat> so we did the typical thing, non-invasive testing. You can see that his right calf waveform does not have the typical augmentation of its amplitude, right? Typically from the thigh to the calf, remember there are blood pressure cuffs here in the high thigh and in the calf, you would expect that the volume of blood reaching the calf would be higher because of the common femoral, the SFA, and the profunda. So the volume of blood you would expect to be higher at the level of the calf. And so you should get some augmentation or a higher amplitude of this waveform here. And you can see you didn't. So in this case, there's no augmentation from thigh to calf. So I know that there's some level of fempop disease. The ankle waveform looks pretty good. And uh, so is the transmat waveform. And we have an ABI of 0.6. So <clears throat> I think this gives you all the information you need really, along with a good vascular exam. Our lab, we also most of the time do a duplex arterial ultrasound so we can get a better idea of what's happening and that confirmed an SFA occlusion with some collaterals. And so we knew automatically what we were dealing with. And so there's two ways to approach this. I can go left groin up and over or I can go anagrade straight down, depending on if the common femoral, profunda, and the proximal SFA are normal. So in this case, what about a CTA or MRA? A lot of people always, you know, a lot of our fellows especially say, why not do a CTA and MRA? You could. You can definitely do a CTA or MRA. It just depends on your situation, your practice, how easy it is to get it, how fast you, know, you can get these things whether your patients, your population is willing to get it. For us, you know, it is very hard. The time to get a CTA and MRA takes a lot of time. Sometimes the pre-authorization with insurance, it may take them weeks to get the, the study done. Patients sometimes during that time may decide not to come back. So there's a lot of things you can do it. And I already have most of the information. There's not a lot of other information I'm going to glean, except maybe calcification. I can measure vessels right away. But I'm going to do angiography. I'm going to do IVIS. So I'll be able to get all that information on the table while I'm, while I'm treating this patient. So in this case, they did have a CT that was previously done, an old CTA. And so I pulled it up to show you that this doesn't really give me a whole lot of information in this case. I mean, look at this. I mean, this is, was calc you can't really see what's going on here. You can see this here. So in this case, it didn't help, but I think a true CTA would definitely make a difference. Again, depends on your lab. So I went straight to angiography. I went actually left groin, I went up and over. And you can see on the far left, here's the inflow, right? I'm double checking to make sure the inflow looks normal. Even though I had a normal common from artery pulse, <clears throat> we wanted to make sure that looked okay. Second image, you can see here's your profunda, 
plus collaterals. Here's your SFA occlusion right here, reconstitutes here, really at the adductor canal, right? There it is right there. Hopefully you can see that cap. And the patient had a two vessel runoff. You can't see it very well, mainly because of this CTO, there wasn't good flow distally, but we knew that he had a two vessel runoff. So how do I approach this? I'm looking at this SFA occlusion and I wanna assess the caps. Here's the proximal cap in this left screen. Here's the distal cap. So you could make the argument, well, this pro distal cap looks a little bit more favorable in terms of trying to approach it because of the morphology or the shape. So maybe I should go pedal or maybe I should stick the pop or the distal SFA and come up. And there's many of operators that do that. My uh, approach is always to try integrate first for at least 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and, or at least until it looks like I'm making no progress or not getting anywhere before I start using alternate access pathways. That means pedal access, distal SFA, pop, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, I saw that there was a little bit of a nipple here. If you see this teat right here coming off this huge collateral. So the reason this is a tough recan from above is mainly because your catheter and wire, as many of you know, will just keep going into this collateral. But I thought I could rotate a catheter into that and that would give me a, a good starting point. Now, for those of you who have never you know, done an SFA CTO or seen it, I sped up this video. And this is a floral capture while I was doing it. Again, I'm using an O18 CTO catheter. In this case, it's a CXI by Cook. You can use uh, any other catheter or company you want. And I have a, uh, a Command uh, 18 guide wire, which is uh, it's a basically a low gram tip wire. You can use a V18 by Boston. You can use a Command 18 by Abbott. There's all different companies. So in this case, I'm using a Command 18, and this is what it looks like. <clears throat> so you can see I have a catheter, and I'm recanning. And I think you can see right away I went subintimal right here. And then I'm using a classic technique, which is when the wire loops around the catheter, or outside the tip of the catheter, you push the whole system. This works really well. So you can see here, right here, that's a classic recan. So I want to just let you watch that a few times. You can see I went subintimal here. So now I know that I have to re-enter at some point. <clears throat> but because of the level of calcification in the SFA, I didn't think I could get intraluminal through here anyway. And, uh, and so uh, I basically just took that route, took that course. So you can see again, here it is, catheter comes up, there's my loop, I'm pushing. Classic recan technique when you're looking at chronic total occlusions in, in our big arteries, especially like SFAs. So then I got down to here to that reconstitution point we saw at the adductor canal. And I did a run with me injecting contrast and I had this. And so now you can see that because I was doing this, re this recanalization and I was trying to re-enter the true lumen, I was using a heavier tip load guide wire to re-enter from the subintimal space intraluminal. And now you can see I'm basically extra luminal. And so you might think to yourself, oh man, this is really bad. But remember, I'm in a closed structure without any flowing blood. This is basically the contrast that I'm injecting that you're seeing in the tissue. So it's not as bad as it seems or it looks. So basically, what do you do at this point? You can try different tip load guide wires. You can pull your catheter back. But at this point, somebody had talked about using other devices. I use the reentry device. And you can see here that that basically is an 014 wire. So I use the reentry device in this case to gain access into that popliteal artery. And then once I, I got access, there's two different scenarios that can occur here. Well, I got my wire across. I do atherectomy. So I did atherectomy. You can take your pick and whether you want to do laser or orbital or rotational, et cetera. I think directional is kind of tough because it's a pretty long segment occlusion. It'll take you a long, long time. But I did do atherectomy and then I did angioplasty. And I want you to see what the angioplasty looks like. You can see that just doing the angioplasty alone, you can see various levels or degrees of stenosis and occlusion. And you want to do a slow, gradual inflation. I sped this up. But typically, we go up after atherectomy, we go up to two atmospheres. We leave it there for about 10, 15 seconds. Then I eventually go up to four atmospheres, so very low pressure. And I leave it at four atmospheres, even though it's not fully inflated. And if you just do fluoro spots every 
15 to 30 seconds while you're leaving that balloon up, you'll see it slowly start inflating the profile. It's a very, it's an amazing thing to see, especially after you've done vessel prep, in the, you know, as I did in this case with atherectomy. So I did a prolonged inflation. Most CLI operators will do anywhere from two to three minutes. I do two minutes. Some people do uh, up to four, but I think anywhere between two and four is, is probably the right thing to do to reduce your risk of dissection and, and also reduce your risk of perforation because again we've done good vessel prep low pressure inflation and then you do an angiogram and then it looks like this so you can see i have a widely patent lumen i have no recoil it's wide open it's flowing well there's no dissection no residual stenosis you can check it with IVIS if you want to confirm because that will give you the most accurate picture and so in this case you can say to yourself well do I need to stent this? No. So obviously, I think most people would say that the data is pretty good. Let's leave nothing behind. And so I, you can do drug-coated balloon. So you do a three-minute inflation with a drug-coated balloon of your choice from whatever company you like. And then basically, you've, you've optimized this patient for long-term. You've prevented a stent. Because remember, once you put a stent in, you got to start counting. That's scenario one if it, if it goes well and it looks like that. But here's scenario two. Similar case, right? I get through, I do atherectomy, I do my angioplasty with my usual technique, I balloon it, I balloon it two or three more times because it looks like this, and you basically have irregularity, you have diffuse high-grade narrowing, and you've got significant recoil. And so this obviously is not going to respond to drug-coated balloons. So now you have to think to yourself, am I going to use a bare metal stent, a, a uh, covered stent, Am I going to use a drug eluding stent? Those are really your three options. And I think there's data for all of them. I think, you know, in today's world, a lot of people like the Supera stent because it's got good three-year data. It has no drug. It's not covered. I think you could use a Viabon here because it's got good data, especially if you have a good runoff, two, three vessel runoff. Its patency rates at three, at three years is really good. And uh, you could also use a drug eluding stent. This was like, you know, when we were... Uh, using a lot of drug eluding stents. And so we actually, uh, I went to a drug eluding stent in this case. I knew I needed a scaffold. I wanted to give the drug to give it some extra, um, um, you know, uh, drug effect to hopefully uh, give it the best shot for this patient. And then so in this case, I did drug eluding stent. And you can see that there's a nice, nice brisk flow. That recoil is gone. Two different views to make sure everything looks okay. Here's our post. You can see the ABI increase from 0.57 to 1. And the waveform here is, is, is normal. You can see it has a better shape than this one, right? It has a better shape. looks normal. So that's a good case of an SFA in two different scenarios to think about.